My name is uh, PJ Kerner. I'm the CTO and, and co-founder of Illumio. So um, first thing I want to do is I want to dive into a little bit more to the you know, architecture. So um, Alan gave uh, a good overview of what, what is happening. So the first thing is let's start with um, you have application workloads that are running um, in multiple environments or running across you know, bare metal servers or you know, virtualized servers. And um, what we have is the first component is that Ven, right, which is a software agent that is sort of installed into those images if they're already running or sort of baked into um, the, the golden image or you know, baked into AMIs or whatever, they, whatever you know, the, the, the philosophy you might have. Um, and what they really do is they really have two functions and, um, and you can think of it as an antenna, right? There's a send and receive function. So the first function is, is um, uh, the send function. The send function is where it sort of inspects what's going on inside the host itself. Understanding running processes, open ports, um, is also collecting a bunch of traffic, right? We, we talked about you know, this being a relationship-based system, right? So understanding who is talking to who is critically important to providing some of the data visualizations and doing the enforcement. Um, and that is the first part of what the VEN does, all that, the collection and, and, um, and dissemination of that, of that information. Then you have the second component, which is the policy compute engine. The policy compute engine is kind of the, the brain of the system. Um, first thing it does is it collects that information and provides some of those, those visualizations that you'll sort of see uh, in a few minutes when, you know, uh, when, when Matt does some of the demos. Um, but then what happens is a, if someone wants to configure a segmentation policy, right? They sort of describe this policy in a high-level language, and we'll talk about um, the policy model in more detail because I think it's one of the you know innovations that Illumio has brought to market. But they sort of describe that policy in sort of a natural language, a way that a developer might describe uh, the way an application works, um, and you sort of uh, configure that policy in the PCE. Then what the PCE does as part of that is it actually computes all of the necessary instructions right, to implement that policy. Right? And you could have one very simple policy line, and we'll sort of see some of this later, is like all dev machines can talk to dev machines. Very simple. But there could be hundreds of thousands of instructions that are necessary to actually implement that policy. And the, it's the PCE's job to figure all that out and sort of calculate that and sort of then disseminate those back out back to the VENs. And that's where the VEN comes back into the picture. That's the receive function. Once those, those instructions are received, they're actually programmed into native controls, right? IP tables in uh, the Linux workloads or Windows filtering platform um, on, on, the Windows, on the Windows system. So you, at that point, you can think about the VEN as a control plane element, right? Using native data plane elements that are in the hosts to do, the, to do that enforcement. Um, and one of the critical things was not to introduce any kind of kernel modifications into the uh, into the uh, these data center applications. These are very kind of critical things, and uh, um, that was a critical design element. Um, and the same model is used for doing what Alan sort of brought up: secure connect, which is do point-to-point -point IPsec. Right. So that same model is used: collect the information and then calculate the necessary instructions to to program free Swan and allow that. Uh, control plane element to do point-to-point -point communication between uh, the different you know, application segments. So that is, um, that is the general architecture. And the most important thing here is that this is, uh, why we use the word adaptive, is because as these change, and we'll have some more, uh, uh, as these change or grow or you get new applications into the environment, they sort of check in and this thing sort of continues to sort of process uh, in, a, in a loop. Okay. Any questions or comments or, and we'll keep going. There'll be more opportunities. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, so that was just the general what it is. Um, I want to talk about why this is, ha this is happening. Like why did we sort of, uh, Lumio need to be, um, need to be done? Um, in my opinion, there were three sort of trends that were happening in data centers, right? So one is data centers were becoming more dynamic, right? More distributed and more heterogeneous, right? And we had to kind of rethink what security needed to be when a data center, you know, was was following these 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 trends. And I sort of want to talk about a little bit about like what were some of the first attempts to address some of those trends? What I believe were some of the breakpoints. Right um, of, of, of why those things are getting more complicated, and then what Illumio had to be, what the security solution had to be to address those things.
So let's talk about dynamic for a second, right? Think about the history uh, of the data center, right? You know, 20 years ago, you used to have a catalog. You picked your you know, data center servers. They, you, know, you ordered them. They showed up on the, the pallet, and you racked and stacked them. We're talking about a speed of like months to sort of get new sort of workloads into the data center. You had VMware arrive, right? And now you have the way to do software servers. You can spin things up and, and, and down more frequently. You have the arrival of public cloud and private cloud environments. Now you have people doing self-service infrastructure. And then you sort of have containers, right? Data workloads in the data centers are becoming more and more dynamic and it's not slowing, and it's not slowing down. So what were some of the first attempts? Some of the first uh, attempts to sort of address the dynamic nature of the data center was to have automated infrastructure, right? So you have you know, Puppet and Chef and those tools that allow you to sort of program th those things, um, or you have you know, software-defined networking, which is again the same, the same model. Being able to have programmable infrastructure allow you to sort of deal with some of the dynamic nature of the data centers. But in my opinion, some of the breakpoints here are um, you know, microservices architectures, right? You have things that are you know, scaling up and scaling down at a, at, at, a, at a very quick pace. You have containers, right? Containers have sub-second lifetimes, or in certain cases do have sub-second lifetimes, right? These things come up, do their job, and then disappear, right? How do you sort of provide security at that, at that pace? And then there is just the general march of DevOps and people wanting to sort of push application development faster and faster, right? And so what did Illumio do to sort of bring into, what are some of the architectural elements? Is first we knew all this data, like all this telemetry and all this data sort of coming in had to be handled by a stream processing engine on the front end to be able to deal with that. And that was kind of a fundamental principle. And then having an adaptive architecture, as I sort of said, um, is there is this policy model. It's in a declarative policy model. You sort of say how you want the policy to be, and this thing needs to sort of generate instructions and adapt in real time to be able to sort of keep that invariant, that policy invariant for you. So those are some of the key things. Then you talk about distributed, right? You, so there's self-service infrastructure, right? Um, you know, the, the, and, um, and then there is the, the trend towards these large flat, you know, these large flat, you know, spine leaf networking, uh, networking models that uh, are being adopted. So what happens? There is no longer any, you know, when you used to set up the applications, you used to you know, you set up the set of workloads and they used to be in the same rack. Now people can sort of put, app, put workloads for the same application anywhere. Right? They could be geographically distributed. They could be distributed anywhere in the, in the data, center, data center. And the network has done a great job to be able to connect all these things to allow those things to be happen. But now you have a problem. Once you've done that, like put it, now you, once you've done that, um, you have a problem. And how do you sort of, how have people sort of address it? One is though, if they want to do segmentation, you can sort of choose a really large box, and, right? And sort of do the choke point, uh, you know, traffic hairpinning trick to sort of address some segmentation in east-west traffic. You can also go the distributed choke point model. Um, but effectively, in, in my opinion, any kind of the, those on a stick solutions have always sort of, that was been a, the first approach, and they've always sort of transitioned to a fully distributed uh, approach. Right? And then some of the breakpoints are you have application sprawl. Sorry, I talked about it. Applications can sort application workloads for applications can be anywhere in the data center. You have a question about choke points. Where are they supposed to be? How many do you need? Right? Who is going to manage all of the all of this infrastructure? And then the third problem is really kind of rule explosion. If you really want to do fine-grained segmentation, the number of rules necessary to implement that in that kind of sprawled environment increases. <coughs> You know, dramatically, and we have we have you know, people who have told us they have like three and a half million firewall rules to sort of address their segmentation, and that's not getting smaller. And so, what what is what has Illumia done? Right, followed this centralized policy distributed enforcement model, pushing everything out to the edges, um, where there is actually context about the application. You know, sort of returning to the you know original founding principles of how the you know the internet was founded. You know, smarts at the edges, right? And secondly, we don't follow a traditional kind of you know, firewall rule processing engine. It is really around, this whole system is built around graph theory and algorithms that, are, that represent certain graphs of your network. And that's what a network is. It is a graph of things. There are nodes and edges, and you need to compute on that graph. Um, um, and then the final thing is, um, is sort of being you know, heterogeneous, right? So you have people who have done, um, you know, they have bare metal servers, they have virtualized servers, 
right? And you have some approaches to sort of address that problem of like, you know, like there's a gateways between the virtualized and the non-virtualized environment, and that's where you sort of put in certain enforcement. Or you've done like a grand unified manager where you sort of manage infrastructure across multiple different heterogeneous environments. But things are getting more, you know, heterogeneous. You know, it's, there's multi-hypervisor environments. There's cloud and you know, public cloud and you know, traditional data center deployments, multi-cloud environments, right? And all these things didn't come necessarily because of technology choices. Sometimes they came because of acquisitions. Like the business guys have decided that these two companies should be together, and all of a sudden now you have a Azure footprint and an Amazon footprint and a traditional data center. And I'm in IT, and now I need to sort of solve this the, this problem. So, there, so, um, and then. Um, and then again, how Illumio sort of addressed these things is followed this uh, a distributed software model. Again, being able to have that Venn and have it be installed into the OS itself allows us to sort of go to public cloud, be in a private cloud, be on a bare metal server, and sort of apply policy you know, across all those things. And then following this declarative policy model, and we'll talk more uh, a little in a second about why, what the policy model is and why we sort of invented it. But Having a very simple policy model that allows you to sort of define certain things and then, and then have the policy community to figure out how to implement that policy anywhere it needs to be was kind of critical to actually solving the, the, the heterogeneous problem. Questions, comments? I, I suppose you'll probably get into it more. So the one question I have, in greenfield deployments when you're, you're baking in your VIN into an image. Uh, that's, that's one thing. So do you have any brownfield use cases or how do you gain visibility into potentially non-Linux or Windows workloads? You wanna take that? Sure, so um, one of the, uh, this is Matthew Glam, the Vice President of Product Management. Um, one of the things that the system does, remember when PJ put up the graph and Alan put up the graph, talked about the telemetry sending up, so one of the things that the, if it's not, if, if it's not between two hosts that have the vent on it, we can actually see it's talking to something, we don't have a vent on it, and we can make it into an unmanaged workload on the graph. And we actually have customers where they put in their entire CMDB data into the policy compute engine. And so we can understand and contextualize that it's something that has a vent and compute policy about what it's allowed to talk to that doesn't have a vent on it, right? So um, there's a variety of ways that we actually handle that. Um, and it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Every single enterprise seems to have something different. Um, not everybody's homogenous in the world, because uh, IT is evolutionary. It's not, nobody starts with a green clean slate, as you point out. So it really depends on what the customer does. But we always can gain visibility into that traffic. The one thing we obviously cannot solve is if you have like a, a NetApp filer talking to an AS400, we may not see that. It's probably also just one more thing to add is 90, 93% of our deployments are brownfield data centers. We appear like a cloud security system. Almost all of our businesses is in brownfield data centers. It's an interesting, we thought it was gonna be much more cloud centric three years ago. And, and I, the next slide actually might also uh, you know, address some of this. So the question is what, there's one under kind of critical feature that underpins this. It's visibility, right? Being able to understand, and that's where the brownfield does come into, understand what's going on. So this is where we've sort of, and I, th th we'll show this live in a few, in a few minutes, but I'm just gonna show a few uh, bits of uh, you know, PowerPoint here. So if you actually want, and this is, a, this is actually a, you know, a customer that we've done a um, illumination graph on. We've collected metadata, right? Um, and we're not, there's no policy enforcement involved here. So this is actually really getting to that that point about understanding what's going on before you can actually do enforcement. And they have multiple data centers. This is about 3,000 workloads that we've, we've um, you know, collected data on. So, and the way we start with visualizations is, one is this, there's a data center view. These are the data centers in this environment, right? If we drill down into one of the data centers, and this is real data, right? This is their, all their applications that they have inside one of those data centers. Well, what do you want to know next? That's 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 interesting picture. But now you want to understand well, what are the relationships? So you have this one that has you know 99. What other applications are use are leveraging this service, right? If you have a, a microservices model, what else is using that, and what does it use, right? Being able to see those relationships. Here's another picture of a different application, you know, in that data center. Being able to sort of explore relationships based on that data. Then you kind of want to clear out. Okay, let's clear out all that clutter 
and actually show relationships between those different applications and across data centers, right? All this can be done by ingesting that telemetry and being able to do this. And, this, and, um, and then you sort of want to dive a little bit more and sort of actually understand what the application topology is, right? Here's a, you know, a compute node cluster that's talking to an etcd, you know, daemon for, you know, xcd cluster for, um, for you know, um, um, service uh, discovery, right? So this is how you can actually explore the data well before, and that's what's necessary. So you actually have to have that understanding, right? You need the distributed architecture to sort of be able to do enforcement, and that's the only way you can sort of make, you know, a, a, a system scale to, you know, data center. It's a follow-up question. Um, so there's obviously a lot of tools today, agentless and agent-based tools. So uh, the one that, that I'm most familiar with is App Dynamics that has a lot of this agent-based uh, application information. Uh, is it, so when you do discovery, can you use those existing tools and how do you partner with, with vendors that may already be in place in a, in a, in a deployment that's doing similar visibility? So, so I guess, uh, so it's good to, um, so everything we've sort of built is built on a set of RESTful JSON APIs, right? Um, so first of all, so anything you can do through the UI that we'll sort of show you, people actually want to automate, right? So you want to be able to, and a lot of people don't use the UI and click on these things, I mean, maybe some, for some of the data visualization, but for some of the other things you're not going to click, um, you sort of want to be able to program those things. So we have a set of APIs that allow us to ingest certain of that telemetry from potentially other partners who might have that data. They might be able to do that, give us that data, we can produce those visual visualizations, and then you would sort of progress to installing the agent, and even the agent goes initially into a uh, an idle mode where it actually doesn't touch anything, just collects the information, and you sort of progress in your in your in your process to towards enforcement uh, or towards your segmentation to meet your segmentation goals. So you start with illumination and sort of progress down that path. Did that answer your question? So, more, more or less. It, so, so for the for the workload that I would want to take uh, action and use uh, Illumio to 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 uh, secure those workloads, uh, it's a, more or less a rip and replace. I would put Vin in place of, of something we may have now for vi for, for the well, visibility. Well, App Dynamics. I mean, App Dynamics has application level telemetry. Like it understands yeah. like what your job, like the call times for Java and so on. Right. Those are these are these are complementary kind of things, right? This is really about understanding the network flows, right? Understanding the communication pattern, right? And then being able to sort of enforce. So the, like on those two things, those would be complementary things. more complementary than there, okay. Is this, this kind of stops at that layer three, layer four though, and it doesn't go up to like user-based kind of mapping or any of that kind of? So, so, so two things, so one is um, we do have process-based enforcement. So you can actually say that this process, independent of port, Right, is allowed to sort of communicate, and then then um, to other those other hosts. So you can go up to the process base because you have the you have the agent there able to sort of do those things. And one of the other use cases is that adapter user segmentation, where we actually do enforcement based on the user context, right? Who is logged in and what they're allowed to have access to, right? So so yes, we can like. Um, yes, we can go up the up the stack as well, right? And, th and then that's the value proposition of having an agent there uh, able to do those things.